morning, America. New overnight, the new details about the man who police say admits to fatally shooting the former NFL player Joe McKnight, now released from custody. Mr. Gasser did not stand over Mr. McKnight and fire shots into him. His past run-in with the law at the exact same location. The reaction overnight as McKnight's family speaks out this morning. Hello, Taiwan. Donald Trump shaking up diplomatic protocol to take a call from their president, breaking with nearly 40 years of tradition. China is ripping us off. Will this stir up an international firestorm? Plus, Sarah Palin at odds with Trump over his latest deal. Caught on camera, look at this holiday delivery warning this morning. A robber dressed as a UPS worker gets a homeowner to open the door. Three others burst in, guns blazing. I grabbed the gun and we started tussling over it. The uh, weapon was discharged in the house. The things to look for before you open the door. It's a lot. And the ABC News exclusive sharing his wife's story. Keith Papini revealing new details about his wife's kidnappers. I will share with you that they're faces were always covered. Plus, what Sherry relied on to survive her horrifying ordeal. Live from ABC News in New York, this is Good Morning America. Hey, good morning. So many people talking about that 2020 interview this morning. Keith Papini revealing new details about his wife's terrifying and, and bizarre ordeal only to ABC's Matt Gutman. And Matt's going to be here much more uh, with much later in the show with much more on this case. Such a riveting story. But we're going to start here with the angry reaction this morning. After the latest twist in the case of former NFL player Joe McKnight, we want you to look at this flood of tweets from people in the pro football community. McKnight was shot and killed in an apparent road rage incident in Louisiana. And the next day, the police decided to release the shooter. They have not charged him. We're now learning that the same man was involved in yet another road rage incident in the same location. ABC's Eva Pilgrim is in Gretna, Louisiana for us this morning. Hi, Eva. Good morning. Ten years ago, court documents show Ronald Gasser was accused of beating up a man at this gas station over an apparent road rage incident. Now this week at this stoplight, he admits to shooting a man. This morning, new details about the man who police say admits to shooting a former NFL running back during what authorities are calling a road rage incident. We definitely need answers. Why was he released? They have usurped and corrupted the criminal justice system. Investigators say Ronald Gasser, seen here in cuffs, shot 28-year-old Joe McKnight three times. The Jefferson Parish coroner telling ABC News the former USC standout who played for the Jets was hit in the hand, shoulder, and chest. Mr. Gasser admitted to um, shooting Joe McKnight Jr. McKnight's family and supporters in the community outraged his killer was released from custody and has not been charged. I want answers. I want the truth to come out. It's not a white or black thing. It's a right or wrong thing. According to records released by the sheriff's department overnight, Gasser was arrested for a violent fight during a road rage incident in 2006 at a gas station at the same intersection where he allegedly shot and killed McKnight. Charges from the 2006 incident were later dropped. On Thursday, investigators say witnesses reported seeing the two men arguing. The sheriff telling ABC News McKnight was not armed when Gasser fired those shots from his car. Mr. Gasser did not stand over Mr. McKnight and fire shots into him. Still, the sheriff says charging Gasser before a thorough investigation is completed would be a rush to judgment. McKnight's family overcome with emotion. It was like I, I lost a friend, I lost a, my, my everything. And the sheriff saying this case is very personal for his department. The man who raised McKnight was a sheriff's deputy. Dan. All right, Eva, I'll pick it up from here. Thank you so much. We want to bring in ABC News consultant Brad Garrett, a former FBI special agent. Brad, thanks for joining us. And people, understandably, right now are outraged. There's no denying that Ronald Gasser killed Joe McKnight. So why would Gasser be released and not charged? Because under Louisiana law, looking at justifiable homicide, if you are in your vehicle and someone attempts to enter it, now we don't know that fact, but I'm going to presume that for a second, that Mr. McKnight tried to get into Mr. Gasser's vehicle, he's justified in shooting him. And I, 
The sheriff basically alluded to that yesterday in a press conference that justifiable homicide may play into effect in this case. Yeah, law enforcement said there's no video of the incident and Gasser was not standing over McKnight when he was shot. But I want to ask you about Gasser's prior record. As you heard in the piece, he was arrested in 2006, another road rage incident in nearly the identical location. Is this going to factor into this investigation, Brad? It will, not, it will not factor into the investigation of this particular situation, Paul, and I'll tell you why. I've worked a lot of murders, and what happens is a person may have been charged with murder in the past or a suspect, but you have to look what's in front of you, and I think that's what the sheriff's trying to do. If he is charged, it becomes more relevant once you get in court. All right, Sheriff promising a deliberate and a thorough investigation. Brad, thanks for your insight as usual. Thanks, Brad. Dan? We are going to move on now to an extraordinary impasse. In the case of Michael Slager, the former police officer charged with murder, he was caught on video shooting an unarmed black man in the back as that man was running away. We may now, though, be looking at a hung jury, all because of one juror. ABC's Steve Osinsami is in Charleston, South Carolina, on the story this morning. Steve, good morning to you. Good morning to you, Dan. This is one of the first times I've ever covered a trial where we not only know there is a lone holdout juror, but we're pretty sure which one. That said, this jury has agreed to keep going. If you'll bring the jury. This morning, the one juror who says he doesn't want to convict this former police officer is at home going over his thoughts. He speaks for many in this community who have trouble second guessing a law enforcement officer. Even when the officer is seen here in video recorded on a cell phone, shooting a black man who's running away from him in the back. In court, the holdout juror wrote to the judge. I cannot, with good conscience, consider a guilty verdict. At the same time, my heart does not want to have to tell the Scott family that the man that killed their son, brother, and father is innocent. Michael Slager is fighting murder and voluntary manslaughter charges. Murder could mean life in prison. Of the nearly all-white jury, it appears that the holdout is a white juror who looked visibly at odds with the others. It's clear this juror was listening when Slager's attorney told them that they needed to send a message of support to police across America. Don't let that happen. The Scott family and their lawyers hope this juror has a change of heart when the jury meets again. It's been a long day. It's been a tough day, but it's not over. And we do believe within our heart that we will see justice for my brother. Jurors will come back here first thing Monday morning. The jury foreman, who's the only African-American of the group, believes they can come to a verdict with a little more time. Based on the questions they're asking, it appears they're looking at the manslaughter charge and not murder. Paula? All right, Steve Osinsami, thank you. No doubt this case could really set a precedent for other similar cases around the country. Thanks, Steve. And this morning in politics, Donald Trump defending his decision to accept a phone call from the president of Taiwan. That's something that no U.S. president or president-elect has done in nearly four decades. This controversy, it's all brewing as the Trump team continues crisscrossing the country and what's being billed a thank you tour. ABC's David Wright is at Trump Tower for us this morning with the very latest on the transition. Hi, David. Hi, Paula. Beijing this morning said it has lodged solemn representations to the U.S. over that call. And Trump is now the first U.S. Uh, leader to speak with the Taiwanese president since Jimmy Carter. It has the makings of a diplomatic incident. And it's impossible to say right now whether this was a rookie mistake or a deliberate provocation. China is ripping us off. You know who's getting the oil? China. What China is doing to us is horrible. On the campaign trail, Donald Trump made a habit of promising to be a thorn in China's side. They are the greatest currency manipulators ever. And now Trump is keeping that promise with a simple phone call. By accepting a congratulatory call from Taiwan's president, President-elect Trump broke four decades of U.S. diplomatic tradition. Ever since Nixon's visit to China in 1972, the U.S. has had a one-China policy, recognizing only one of the two countries that call themselves China. Overnight, he tweeted defensively that Taiwan's president called me. 
Top aides won't say if the fact that he took the call signals a change in U.S. policy. He's well aware of what U.S. policy has been. Trump has yet to announce his secretary of state, the top diplomat whose job it would be to smooth over any bad feelings in Beijing, one of seven cabinet seats yet to be filled. And Trump is now taking flack from a possible pick for VA secretary, Sarah Palin, over the deal he struck with Carrier. Palin, an early endorser of Trump's, is going rogue in this op-ed, blasting the Carrier deal as crony capitalism at a hallmark of corruption and socialism. Now, Trump isn't showing any signs of changing his approach to job displacement, tweeting overnight about another Indiana company that's taking its jobs to Mexico, naming and shaming them. The company is called Rexner, Dan. Can't remember a presidential transition that was uh, this eventful. Uh, David Wright, thank you very much for your reporting this morning. Let's talk more about all of this now with ABC News political analyst Matthew Dowd. Uh, let's start. Good morning, by the way. Good morning. Let, let's start with this thing in Taiwan. Many foreign policy experts are aghast uh, that the president-elect did this. Some people, however, are applauding him. So in your view, is Trump crazy or crazy like a fox? Um, probably a little bit of both uh, would be the definition of this. I was thinking about what sort of typifies this, and I thought of the movie Rush Hour. Um, his supporters and his staff are acting like he's Jackie Chan, knows exactly what he's doing in all this. Everybody else thinks he's Chris Tucker stumbling through this and maybe finds a success in the middle of this. I think it's problematic for two I hope our viewers have seen Rush Hour, <laughs> by the way. For three of them. There's three Rush Hours, so you better have thought one. Um, uh, the, to me, it's problematic for two reasons. One is if he did this unintentionally, obviously that's a big rookie mistake and he needs to figure that out if he didn't understand what our policy has been towards China. But two, if he did this intentionally, but he did it without a Far East policy in place to explain why, what the context of this, and a staff in place that actually could explain to the public why you were doing this, what's the outcome of this, and what's the real strategy of this. My guess is this was Donald Trump doing something viscerally, took a call from a, a leader, and now is trying to figure out how in the aftermath of that to explain it. So some of the other uh, phone calls he's had with foreign leaders have raised some eyebrows. Just a couple of examples here. He praised the president of Kazakhstan, even though that president is really a dictator. He invited the president of the Philippines to Washington, even though there's been... Uh, a lot of howling about massive human rights abuses in Philippines in the last year or so. So what do you think overall is going on here? And it, could it be good that he's just shaking things up? Uh, well, I think, one, his supporters think it's really good. Getting in a fight with China, I think, is a good thing for most of his supporters in this. I think it does demonstrate he probably needs to get a Secretary of State nominee on the board pretty quickly. But one thing we learned in the campaign and that we're now learning him as president. He didn't play by the rules in the campaign. He's not going to play by the rules of dip diplomacy and international relations. He's just not going to do it. Very quickly before we run here, Sarah Palin, she, did she just cost herself a, uh, a cabinet post? My guess is she, that was already decided before, and then she released the statement. But one thing, I think she's right, actually. This is a, a case of rewarding a specific company with it. So in this case, from conservative Republican policy, she's right. It's anathema to them. That, that Donald Trump did this. Matt Dowd, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, and uh, the people from Rush Hour, thank you as well. Uh, a quick programming <laughs> note here. Uh, ABC yeah. News chief anchor George Stephanopoulos is going to go one-on-one -on -one with the vice president-elect Mike Pence tomorrow morning on This Week right here on ABC. Thanks again, Matt. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. We want to send things over to Ron Claiborne for a look at the other headlines, including a school bus crash. Yeah, that's right. Uh, good morning to you, Paula and Dan. Robert, good morning, everyone. We begin uh, in Midland, Texas, where a school bus during a high school cheerleading squad collided with a tractor trailer overnight sending at least 11 people to the hospital. Two of the injured are reported in critical condition, others in serious condition. The cheerleaders are returning home from a football game when the 18-wheeler crossed into the path of their bus. And in Los Angeles, a University of Southern California professor was stabbed to death on campus. And this morning, the suspect, a student, is in custody. Police say psychology professor Bosco Chian was uh, targeted by the suspect who attacked him inside of a campus building. The married father joined the USC faculty in 2001. And in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, cheers erupting as a rescue workers free a woman trapped in the rubble of a collapsed building. Officials say the 22-year-old was able to call her mother on her cell phone while trapped, helping rescuers locate her there. Uh, she also managed to, they also managed to pull out her dog alive. One construction worker, though, died in the collapse of the building, which had been undergoing renovations at that time. And that daredevil team that was uh, busted for climbing up one World Trade Center in New York City two years ago, he's in trouble again with the law. Justin Cascao is accused of reckless endangerment and trespassing just after posting dizzying videos on top of some Manhattan skyscrapers. 
He surrendered to police and uh, was released from custody after posting a $15,000 bond. Determined fellow there. And in college football, the number four team in the country, University of Washington, the Huskies rolling over the University of Colorado, the Buffaloes, I believe. 41-10, final score in the Pac-12 championship game Friday night. Uh, that all but guarantees Washington to be one of four teams contending for the national title. Tomorrow is Selection Whoa. Sunday when the four, like that, huh? playoff uh, uh, semifinal playing. matchups will be announced. I'm guessing it's going to be Bama, Clemson, Ohio Washington, State. Ohio State, no Michigan. Yep. <laughs> and, <laughs> and finally, we have finally NBA <laughs> superstar and very vocal Cleveland Indians fan LeBron James proving that sometimes even the king has to eat some crow. You're going to see him here wearing a Chicago Cubs uniform. Polish should make you happy before uh, his game against the Bulls in Chicago after losing a World Series bet to close friend and former teammate Dwayne Wade. LeBron taking it all in stride saying, a bet is a bet. Speaking Paula, a bet is a bet. Why are you looking at me? Do I owe you something? We bet on Ohio State, uh, Michigan. But okay. Don't you owe uh, Rob for I, uh, some recently? I think Rob's paid. Just between We're Rob and I. We're all backed up with our bets, okay? The problem is he, he often pays in singles and pennies, so it's, I don't often look <laughs> A bet is a bet unless, unless, unless you're Ron Claiborne, apparently. Listen, we do have to change the subject Paul quickly you while you explain <laughs> things to Rob. We do want to tell you about this harrowing 911 call. A man talking to the operator while three other men break into the home. Then the homeowner opens fire with his shotgun. Here we ha have the story now from ABC's Adrian Bankert. Two got out. They're getting ready to jump the fence. This chilling 911 call capturing the moment a Florida homeowner makes the split second decision between life and death. They're in the house. That's the voice of 31 year old Warren Darlow whispering to a 911 operator that three men have broken into his home. Then gunfire. Tell me what is happening, sir. I killed one, I think. According to affidavits obtained by ABC News, around 11 a.m. Monday, Darlow told police he saw three men he didn't know get out of a car after pulling into his driveway. Yeah, you speak. I don't know if they're getting ready to come in or not. Darlow grabbing a gun and calling for help as the men shatter a glass door. <laughs> Darlow firing three times. Police telling us one of the men, a 21-year-old, died at the hospital. The two alleged accomplices to that deadly home invasion, also in their 20s, left the scene but were quickly captured. This week, a judge ordering them held without bond. There's a co-defendant in this case who is dead. You are young men. I don't know what you did. I don't know what you didn't do. But here's what I know. You don't want to wind up dead. And even though they didn't fire the weapon, those two young accomplices still face murder charges. We weren't able to reach the homeowner who will not be charged in this case due to the state stand your ground law. Dan and Paula, he said multiple times to the 911 operator that he feared for his life. Scary stuff. Adrian, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Adrian. Let's send things over to Rob. What's shaking in the weather department? Uh, well, the, the trees were shaking in Southern California. Winds were blowing yesterday. Take a look at some of this video. Damage in and around the Los Angeles area. The 101, uh, just outside of Studio City, I made this drive... Uh, Many, many times, and the trees were down and blocked traffic for a time there. Also in Beverly Hills, uh, trees coming down. So 50, 60 mile an hour wind gusts, especially in the hills, were a problem yesterday. There'll be a problem again today. We've got red flag warnings, high wind warnings, at least for this afternoon, and fire danger is going to be critical as well. So we need to obviously be uh, wary of that. Winds could gust us easily in the mountains over 50 or 60, maybe even 70 miles an hour today. Speaking of, of fires, obviously the Eastern Tennessee fires will take all the rain they can get and they'll get a little bit from this system that's rolling across Texas now. A very wet day in Texas and Oklahoma today and then the next couple of days we'll get several rounds of it locally four to eight inches could see some flooding across the Houston area and then through parts of Louisiana as we go through the next 48 hours and some severe storms on Monday. That's a quick check on the national headlines. Here's now is what's happening where you live. Good Saturday morning and we're off to quite a chilly start. Don't forget the heavy coat on your way out. We're going to be feeling breezy today. Leesburg into DC and Frederick with our temperatures and feels like temperatures in the 30s right now. Now later today we have the Toys for Tots at the National Harbor. Not going to be warming up too much in the 40s by later today and we'll expect lots of sunshine. For tonight it's another cold one. Overnight lows drop into the 30s. Partly cloudy skies and it's still a little breezy. In the next half an hour, we talk Hawaii and we talk cold and snow, not mutually exclusive. So.
All right. Look forward to that in 15 okay. minutes. Uh, so, you know what, Tiger Woods trying to stage comeback now. Trying least. and succeeding, at least so far. Tiger had a phenomenal day at the Hero World Challenge yesterday, meaning he enters today within range of the leaders. Now the question is, was it a fluke, or is Tiger finally back? This weekend, the world...